Bukan orang kau kenyi. Bukan orang 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 kenyi. Bukan Lah kerja sama ni desa lah benang, jang kau panjat kan asal kau. Kau jauh mami tu bawa mana? Angel. Bawa bawa nak di mana jadi bes? Throughout history, we have found many ways to organize and structure our societies. For although we are all individuals, we must live with other people as well. These people of Malemchi village in Nepal talk out their differences in town meetings. To function and survive, to ensure social order and security for all, every society requires some form of political organization, a system of leadership, authority, and cooperation. Political organization is an important aspect of every culture, and it is often accompanied by pomp, ceremony, and symbols of authority and unity. There are several distinct kinds of political organization, all uniquely suited to the size of the group, its environment, and the culture of its members. of political organization, a system in which local bands or villages are joined together by kinship or other social institutions, is the tribe. Among the Mendi of Highland New Guinea, villages are linked together by an elaborate system of gift giving, organized according to patrilineal clans, kin groups claiming descent through the male line from a single ancestor. from 20 to 60 households is a land-holding group. The Mendi are horticulturalists. Their main crop is the sweet potato, grown in gardens hacked out of what was once a dense jungle. Women cultivate sugar cane and various types of leafy green vegetables along with the sweet potatoes. Mendy plant their sweet potatoes in composted mounds. These improve the quality of nutrients available to the crop and raise the temperature of the soil a few critical degrees, helping to protect against frost in this high altitude environment. <laughs> Men clear land for new gardens when the old land is exhausted. Until about 50 years ago, 
Warfare among various Highland groups restricted travel, so Mendy were somewhat isolated from their neighbors. They formed political alliances through elaborate gift exchanges organized around the reciprocal roles of males and females. Men are the ceremonial leaders, living apart from their wives in a communal dwelling. They must present to their male relatives gifts of sweet potatoes and pigs, highly valued exchange goods which they can only acquire through the labor of their wives. A high-ranking elder may have as many as nine wives to aid him in his political ambitions, but younger men may have trouble acquiring even a single wife. Young men depend on their senior male relatives for gifts of sweet potatoes, shells, and pigs to raise the necessary bride price. Mendy are exogamous, which means they must acquire a wife from another clan, and she will also be from another village. Bride price exchanges of sweet potatoes and pigs link Mendy of this village in political alliances to men of neighboring villages. This is a dispute over bride price. It is also a very serious political negotiation, allowing an ambitious Mendy man to gain support from his kinsmen, thus strengthening his own ability to influence others. A man who is able to increase his prestige through exchanges is known as a big man. Though he has no formal authority, a big man will have more influence than other men. He may represent his clan in dealing with other clans and be called upon to help settle disputes among clan members. Because the big man's authority is limited, he cannot coerce either the members of his own clan or those of neighboring villages to obey him. Cooperative effort is promoted through large pig feasts, in which pigs, sweet potatoes, shells, and other valuables are distributed through a network of political obligation organized around kin groups. emphasis on social interdependency is reflected in their beliefs about the necessity to avoid provoking jealousy. Mendy believe jealousy is a major cause of sickness and death and may make one an object of sorcery. Even dead ancestors can become jealous of their living relatives. Before Christian missionaries arrived, hosts of the pig feast would feed the blood of their pigs to their ancestors represented by stones kept in small shelters. festival house must be built for the feast, an enterprise that may take months and call on the labor of many people. The festival is an occasion for display, bringing together people from many clans, fostering new political alliances and often marriages.
sponsored by the host clan or by allies who may wish to compete with the splendor of the host group. Each parade requires that individual participants from the host group contribute pearl shells and money in addition to the gifts already allocated in the name of the clan. When the festival is over, much wealth has exchanged hands, alliances have been consummated, and a big man has extended his influence over a wider geographical area. A tribe is a fairly sophisticated form of political organization, linking the fortunes of a number of local groups. It is a way of life most typical of horticulturalists and pastoralists. Until about 10,000 years ago, a simpler way of life prevailed. People lived in small independent groups, known as bands, foraging, taking their sustenance from what the land gave them. Bands have no formal ranking or status. Even food is distributed equally. In such an egalitarian world, there is no need for formal political leadership or organization. desert of southwestern Africa live the Kung. The Kung are nomadic, residing in temporary camps, following the game and seeking the wild plants that provide their food. Even in an egalitarian society, tasks are organized by age and gender. Women gather roots, nuts and berries, which make up the bulk of the Kung diet. Men hunt, make tools for the hunt, and prepare the poison coating for their arrows. As they work, they talk among themselves, reminiscing about hunts that have gone before and planning hunts yet to come. The band numbers at most a few dozen people, nearly all related in one way or another. If food is plentiful, the band may be larger. But if food is scarce, or if there are personal differences between members, the band will split up and the different members will go their own ways, joining other bands in which they have relatives. formal leader of this band. He has no real authority. Decisions are made by consensus. But because Toma is a good hunter and a respected elder, his words may carry more weight, and the other men will often come to him for advice. Among the Kung, age brings with it a great measure of respect. And even in this egalitarian society, elders have certain roles and privileges not shared by younger men and women. When the hunters return with fresh meat, it is the elders who divide and distribute it. For most of human history, people lived in much the same way. It was only relatively recently, as food production led to a more settled way of life, that more complex forms of organization developed.
Because of trade, warfare, and other factors, some communities grew in size and density. These societies moved away from the informal and decentralized leadership of bands and tribes. Leadership became more formal. These societies became very centralized, often with a single hereditary leader, a paramount chief who delegated authority to his relatives. Anthropologists call these societies chiefdoms. These are the Capelli, a chiefdom in Liberia. This man is a close relative of the Capelli's paramount chief, and he functions as a local official, a village chief. Every Capelli man measures his status by his degree of kinship to the paramount chief. The common people are farmers, living in simple houses with thatched roofs. But the chiefs, of which there are several levels, own cattle and live in concrete houses with tin roofs. A chief will often oversee the redistribution of goods. If a farmer's crops fail, the chief will see to it that the man receives food from his neighbor's fields. Unlike the leaders of bands and tribes, who must rely on their ability to persuade, the chief rules by virtue of the authority vested in his office, which he typically acquires through inheritance. Beginning about 5,000 years ago, nearly simultaneously and as the result of intensified food production, a new form of political organization appeared in Asia, the Middle East, and later in the Western Hemisphere. These were states, political organizations with centralized power, a formal code of law, and the authority to use coercion to enforce that law. People were divided into classes. There was an unequal distribution of wealth and a degree of specialization of labor not found with any other form of political organization. States rely on agriculture. These aqueducts were but a small part of the extensive agricultural system developed by the Romans. The result of this intensive farming was production of a food surplus. And it is the management of this surplus that was in large part the basis of the state's power, the source of its legitimacy. Legitimacy is the state's claim to the right to hold and use its power. In the United States and other political systems in the Western European tradition, legitimacy is viewed as being based on the consent of the governed. But at times, a government's legitimacy may be challenged. Unless the people take to the streets and make their will known, the governments will not act. We should get out of the streets and we should protest and uh, let our feelings and our thoughts and our uh, interests be known. Very much. I'm very much worried. Yes. Because how would they ever know? Those are rulers and the legislators and uh, everybody else. You have, we, we have to wait for election. No election. Get out in the street and let, your, uh, let the people know what Tanya Man. Let's go. Let's go. Get in here. Pick them up and move them out of the way. Let's go. After many years of trying to do things that are not confrontational with the law, you have to reach a certain point where you actually put your body on the line. And you actually say, I'm going to willingly break the laws of this country because those laws do not serve my interests. They serve the interests of the big business, of the big corporations, and the government of this country. In many societies, legitimacy is based on religion. Pilgrims have traveled from all over the Himalaya to Ladakh, a province on the Tibetan border in northern India, to celebrate the 800th anniversary of the Trikong order of Tibetan Buddhism. The people have also come to pay homage to one man, Chitsong Rinpoche, a lama who escaped from a Chinese labor camp in Tibet. Rinpoche's story began in 1950 in Tibet, 
At the age of four, he was recognized by abbots of the Drikong order as the reincarnation of their spiritual and political master. Six months later, the little boy was ordained as Drikong Chetsong Rinpoche, the precious one. At the time of Rinpoche's investiture, Tibet was a theocracy, a country where religious leaders were also political leaders. The Buddhist monastic system performed all normal state functions. The Drikung order was a major subsect within this theocracy. Yet, even as Rinpoche's investiture was taking place, the People's Republic of China was beginning to infiltrate Tibet. By 1959, the entire country was occupied by the Chinese army, and 12 centuries of Buddhist rule came to an end. Chetsan Rinpoche was imprisoned. In 1977, two years after his escape from Tibet, Rinpoche came to Ladakh, where he worked to rebuild the theocracy of Tibet within the framework of the modern state of India. later, the success of Rinpoche's efforts was evident. Pilgrims came by the thousands to celebrate the 800th anniversary of the Drikong Order. To commemorate the occasion, a huge tapestry was prepared. It marked the rebirth of an ancient tradition, and for the Buddhists of Ladakh, it was a moving experience. day of the celebration, Rinpoche led an open prayer attended by 500 monks and 7,000 pilgrims. While the Drikang theocracy has been revitalized, it is undergoing cultural translation in Ladakh. Whether Rinpoche's tiny theocracy can survive and prosper in the shadow of modern India and China is still uncertain. Indeed, throughout the world, small political organizations like the Drikung Theocracy, or for that matter, the Mendi tribe or the Kung Bans, are losing autonomy to larger states. These are modern state systems. With their bureaucracies, economies, legislatures, courts and armies, they have much greater power than smaller political systems. As we all become increasingly interdependent internationally, politically and economically, there have been attempts to mediate among various regional groups. but there are also trends in the opposite direction. In Africa, for example, imposition of national governments with laws and borders arbitrarily set by Europeans has met with little success and has been challenged, often violently, by tribal peoples determined to retain their traditional cultures and local political organization. The trend to decentralize is not confined to Africa. For example, the Soviet Union has disintegrated into a number of smaller units generally reflecting earlier political and ethnic boundaries. Whether at the world or local level, to succeed, political organizations must provide for the richness and diversity of human adaptations and the many faces of culture. 